Well, I got home one day and I got out of my car and all of a sudden there was a humming noise in the garage and I'd never heard that noise before and I knew that, that something wasn't right. And so I went all around the garage and I couldn't find it and then I realized at the house we were living in at the time, there was an attic above the garage and the humming noise was coming from the attic. And so I told Brooke, hey, I'm going to get a ladder out and I'm going to go up into the attic and I'm going to figure out what's going on? And she said, I wish you would. And I'm like, it'll be fine. I've, I've got this. It's, it's not a problem. So I got the ladder out and I went up into the attic and I was looking all around the attic. And there I noticed that the, the radon pump was, was making this humming noise that it had never, never made before. And I don't know a lot about radon pumps or electricity, but luckily there are people in our lives who do. And so we made a couple phone calls to people who, who knew about them. And unfortunately, they, they were out, but, but they were able to guide us and via FaceTime. And, and they said, hey, we're pretty sure that it's not the pump, but we're pretty sure the problem is with the GFI plug that you have up there. And I said, fantastic, I'll just run to the hardware store, I'll get a new plug, and that's not going to be a problem. And so I came down the ladder all excited, and I told Brooke, hey, I'm going to run to the hardware store. And she said, why? And I said, I'm going to go get a new GFI plug, and I'm going to install it. And she said, do you want to call an electrician? And I said, no, we'll be fine. She said, are you sure you don't want to call an electrician? I'm like, it's going to be fine. So I went to the hardware store, and I bought the new, bought the new plug, and went up there to get everything and took the cover off and, and realized, well, I know a lot about removing a plug, but I'm not sure I, I know that much about this one. So I made a FaceTime call to a friend of mine who does a lot of electrical work, and I'm, I'm walking him through, and he said, all right, this is what you're going to need to do. It's, it's going to be, you know, it'll, it'll be no problem. Just go ahead and, and do all those things. And I said, all right, fantastic. And he said, before you start, did you kill the breaker? I said, I'm not an idiot. Of course I killed the breaker. And he said, okay, so you plugged something into that and, and tested it to make sure, and, and then you did a voltage. I said, no, but it'll be fine. And he's like, are, are you sure that that breaker is, is because if it's not, when you put that screwdriver in, you're going to get a little shock. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm all right. And he's like, all right, well, I'll guide you through the process. So he's on FaceTime. And as soon as I take my Phillips head screwdriver and I touch the screw, my phone dies. Because I had been talking to other people and I hadn't been looking at the phone battery. So my phone is dead. I'm like, all right, well, I didn't get shocked. Clearly I have it off. So I went ahead and I took the old plug off. And that's when I recognized, well... I should have done this a little slower or made a diagram or something because putting the new one on isn't as straightforward as I thought it was going to be and there's a couple extra wires and I don't know what I'm going to need to do. So I went down the ladder, took my phone, plugged it in, and if you've ever dealt with a phone that's dead, you know that it doesn't just instantly, the second you plug it back in, spring back to life. It's a little temperamental, the fact that you took it down to its death. So it wants to charge for 10, 15 minutes before it comes alive again. And, and so my phone's finally back up, and I'm, I'm calling my friend Chris to ask him the question about how to install the new plug. And he answers his phone, and I'm like, hey. And he's like, hey, I'm a couple blocks from your house. And I'm like, what? And he's like, I thought you were dead. And I'm like... <laughs> I'm like, what? He's like, as soon as you took the screwdriver and you touched the screw, the call went out. He's like, and I know you, so certainly that meant something not good was happening. And so I was on my way over to help you. And I'm like, oh, well, thank you. And, and, and then he came over, and, and what I so appreciated is that not only did he show me what to do, but he walked me through what not to do, which means... I have now successfully, on a few occasions, replaced GFI plugs all by myself. Now, I'm not saying there haven't been some YouTube refreshers in there. Uh, there definitely have. But Chris helped me understand not just what I had to do, but also what not to do in order to make everything go smoothly and in order to make sure that the replacement happened effectively. And I don't know about you, but that's how I learn best. 
I learn best when someone walks me through not only what to do, but also walks me through what not to do. And luckily for me and you, if you're like me in that, Jesus did that for us when he taught us how to pray. We're in the middle of something called growing, and throughout the summer, we're going to be looking at spiritual disciplines and things that we need to do as people who love and follow Jesus to help us in our spiritual development and in our spiritual growth. And so we started this a few weeks ago, and we looked at the importance of engaging with the heart of God as revealed to us in Scripture, and then we saw that the next steps is is to meditate on Scripture and make sure that it fills our minds and it fills our hearts and it's, it's really something that, that defines us, and so really filling, filling us. And today we're going to look at something that's also vitally important to us in our development, and that is prayer. So if you have your phones or your tablets, I'd invite you to follow along with us this morning in the Bible app. It's a free resource that you can find in whatever app store you utilize, and once it's installed on your device, the feature that we use together within the Bible app every week here at Lakeside is called Events. So if you go to the Events feature, either enable your locations or right in Lakeside, Algoma will pop up and you can follow along with us that way. If you have a traditional Bible with you this morning, we're going to be in the New Testament book of Matthew. Matthew's the very first book in the New Testament, Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 is where we're going to start in just a minute. And if you're joining us via the stream this morning, thanks so much for joining us. My name is Brian and I'm part of the team here at Lakeside. The verses will be available for you on the screen below as we learn from Jesus how to pray. We dive into Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, and this is Jesus speaking, where we read these words. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. That they may be seen by others. So, Let's just, let's just pull this apart. And when you pray, right off the bat, what do we see? That there is an expectation. And what is that expectation? That expectation is that we are going to be praying. That we as people who love and follow Jesus, that we are going to pray. That when you pray, that prayer is an essential part of our lives and it's an essential part of us having a relationship with God. This is the expectation. We're going to see it over and over and over again today. When you pray, that is God's expectation for us, that prayer is vital and it's important for us. It's something that we need to do. We understand this dynamic in any relationship. If I were to wake up in the morning and I look over and I I see my wife and, and then we just I just look at her, and then I go about, and I get ready, and as I'm getting ready to leave to come to Lakeside, I walk past her, and I don't call her all day. I don't text her all day. I get home, and I walk into the house, and I don't say anything to her. I don't say hello or anything like that. I, we just pass, and, and, and then we go to bed. What do you think of our relationship? Now, some of you who are ultra introverted are like, that is the relationship I have dreamed of. That sounds fantastic. But even if you, even if you are the most introverted person that God has ever made, there still has to be communication for connection on some level. There still has to be communication for connection on some level. And in the same way that we would say, hey, there's something wrong about the relationship, if at no point in the day you make any effort to communicate, the same is true of us spiritually. The the idea of prayer is not that, oh, I might be engaged with this or if I'm engaged. No, God's expectation is that this is going to be a vital part of our lives when we pray. And then Jesus tells us the next thing. It's don't be like the hypocrites. When you pray, don't be like these people. Don't be like the hypocrites. Well, what's the deal with the hypocrites? The hypocrites were people who were all consumed with this idea of what everybody else's perception and thoughts of them were. The entire substance of the hypocrites was they wanted to live their lives in such a way that what people saw when they looked at them, they thought, ah, 
They've got it all together. Think influencers in our day and age. It doesn't ultimately matter what your life really looks like, but if I make a minute and a half reel where my life looks perfect and it gets enough likes and shares, then everybody's going to think that my life is fantastic. And that doesn't mean that everybody who shares an aspect of their life as an, as an influencer on social media is wrong for doing that. But ultimately, if your entire substance is found, if your entire self-worth is found in giving off this persona and this vibe about your experience and about the life that you don't ultimately lead, but you want people to think you lead, ultimately you live a very a, a very shallow and a very empty life. And the same was true of the hypocrites. Because ultimately what they cared about was not how the reality of their spiritual development was. What they cared about was what everybody else's impressions and thoughts of their spiritual development were. And so as a result, Jesus says, don't be like these people when they pray. And the, the question is, why? Because the hypocrites were all worried about their public persona. They were all worried about their outward presentation. You must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. For them, it's all a show. For them, it is all a show. So does that mean, for instance, that it's wrong to pray if you're out at a restaurant and to pray over a meal? And the answer to that question very well may be, well, sometimes it might be. I don't know your motives. I don't know your heart. Certainly, we see that Jesus, when, when he performed the miracle of multiplying the loaves and the fishes, John tells us that Jesus gave thanks to God. And so if it's, if it's coming from a place of gratitude, it's certainly not wrong. But if you're praying just to be noticed by people, then the answer is yes, it's wrong. And this is an invitation to us to check our motives. And Jesus says, don't be like people whose purpose is to pray so that they could be seen by others. And then he continues and he concludes verse 5 by saying this, truly I say to you, they have received their reward. They've received their reward. They wanted attention and they got their attention. And that's it. That's the end. They have experienced the benefit. They desired attention. They received attention. That is as far as it goes. But Jesus goes on. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Here's the contrast. What do we see once again? Right off the bat, what do we see? When you pray. Again, there's the expectation. The expectation is people that follow Jesus, people that love Jesus, that we are going to be people of prayer. When you pray, Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites, but instead do this. Go into your room and shut the door. And so what we see is Jesus is modeling here that the prayer is private and it's uninterrupted. The prayer is private, and it's uninterrupted. And so a good practice for you to, would be for you to figure out where is a place that you can go, especially if you find yourself struggling with the concept and with the idea and the practice of prayer, then where can you go where you can be private? Or you have some time that's uninterrupted. Is there a room in your house? Is there a place in your house where you can go? And, and you can have privacy and you can be uninterrupted. Is, is that possible? For some of you, you have little kids. And the answer to that question is, it's going to be really challenging because your kids want to be near you and, and they want to be with you. And so you're going to have to be intentional not only to find a place in your house to go, but you're going to have to be intentional about times that you can do this as well, whether that's nap time or bedtime or some other time. But you've just got kids that want to be with you all the time. And if you find yourself in, in that situation, that circumstance, I, I just want to let you know, don't lose heart. Middle school is going to be here before you know it, and your kids are going to leave you alone all the time. So you will have no problem whatsoever finding time away from the kids once they hit middle school. It's just you're going to have to be a little more intentional up to that point. But for some people, the answer might be it's not in your house. For some people, you might need to go outside. For some people, it might be in a car. Figure out what works for you. Are you going to have to turn your phone off? Are you going to have to put your phone on do not disturb? Whatever the case may be, but find a place for you that is private 
where you can have uninterrupted time and be praying and be praying. And notice what Jesus says. That when prayer is done this way, the Father who is in secret sees what you do in secret and rewards you. And I don't know about you, but if I have a choice between the attention of people or the reward of God, I want the reward of God. I want the reward of God. That is ultimately what sustains. That's ultimately so much more fulfilling than attention from people. Attention from people is fleeting. First of all, attention from people isn't all that hard to get. I I discovered this in middle school. Now I'm a child of the 80s. So I grew up in the 80s and the early 90s, long before social media was everywhere, which meant that at least once a football season, we were going to encounter something that you don't encounter anymore because videos live forever. But at least once a football season, there was going to be a streaker. And that's when I recognized, hey, all you have to do to get people's attention is take your clothes off and run somewhere you shouldn't be. And then you're going to get the attention of a lot of people. But ultimately, that probably shouldn't be your end goal in life. Ultimately, you should want something a little bit more than that. So attention isn't hard to get from people. And the other problem with attention is it becomes, it becomes an adrenaline hit. Why does almost every athlete hang on longer than they should? Because they become addicted to the applause. Why do you see musician after musician who should have retired years ago unable to retire? Because they need that next hit. They need that next little bit of the adulation and the adoration from the fans. But here's the problem, and here's the reason that they haven't retired, is that once you taste it, you want more. And the reason is because it doesn't last. It feels great for the moment. Maybe even into the next day. But ultimately, it fades, and it's never enough. And Jesus says, hey, if you pray for a performance, if you pray just to get everybody's attention, you're going to get attention. I'll tell you the truth. That's it. You've received your reward. And so I don't know about you, but if I have the option between choosing of that and choosing for something where God is going to bless me and, and, and reward me, that's the choice I'm making every single time. And when you pray, verse 7 says, and again we see it there, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. God is not oppressed by our vocabulary. We do, not have to, we do not have to pull out the thesaurus and think of different ways that we can approach God to keep Him interested with, with how we're going to phrase things. God is not impressed by how long we pray. And that doesn't mean that if our hearts are burdened, we have a lot of things to pray about, that God is annoyed with us if we pray for a long time. Not at all. But on the flip side, God's not impressed by the length of our prayers. We don't have to pray for hours on end just to get God's attention. Prayer doesn't have to be a marathon. Now, I know some of you have run in marathons, and and you love to run in marathons, and congratulations, that's incredible. My question has always been, why? We have automobiles. We don't need to do that anymore, but if that's something that you love to do, that's fantastic. But have you, as somebody who doesn't run marathons, If you've ever been around somebody training to run a marathon, to me, that's almost as exhausting, if not as exhausting, as running the actual marathon. Because that person who is training to run the marathon is going to tell you more about hydration packs and shoes and training regimens than you have ever cared to know about. And they're just going to keep telling, well, yesterday I ran 15 and a half. Today I'm only doing nine. It's a light day, but tomorrow I'm going up to 17. It's, and you're just like, I don't care. 
Congratulations, but I, do, I don't really care how many miles you're torturing yourself with. That's fantastic. But they're just they're consumed by it, and, and they love to talk about all that they're doing to run that marathon. And it's an impressive feat. Don't get me wrong. Running 26.2 miles is an impressive feat. But sometimes we've, we've convinced ourselves. We've convinced ourselves in the avenue of prayer that I've got to pray for a really long time in order to gain God's favor, in order for God to listen to me. And what Jesus says is God's not impressed by your vocabulary. And He's not impressed by how long you pray. He hammers this point home in verse 8. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Jesus says, get to the point. That need that's in your life right now, that need that you don't know how you're going to satisfy and how you're going to fulfill and how you're going to make ends meet and how you're going to be able to do the very thing that you need to do and that thing that is in your life right now that you don't have the answer to and that burdens your heart and that pains you and that keeps you up at night, that thing, God already knows the solution to. And not only does God already know the solution to, but two months ago, when that thing wasn't even on your radar, God knew it was about to hit. And He didn't just know about it two months ago. He knew about it from eternity past. Before you were created, before the world was created, God knew the crisis you would find yourself in. And if you find yourself at this point where you just don't know where to go, Talk to God about it. And it doesn't have to be a long prayer. It doesn't have to be a prayer that's phrased in a certain way. Just be authentic and be real and talk to God about it. And you feel like, I have, and I've reached the point where I can't do this on my own. Maybe that's the reason you're encountering it. Because you were never meant to walk through life alone. Now Jesus has told us what not to do, but he doesn't leave us there. Now he tells us how we should pray. And verse 9 says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So now we get to the Lord's prayer. Now we get to the Lord's prayer. And, and this is a model that Jesus makes for us for how to pray. And I just, I want to encourage you that this is a prompt. It's not a script. And I certainly think there's value if you ever reach a point in your life where you're struggling with prayer and, and you don't know what to do and you don't know where to go, then, then certainly recite the Lord's Prayer and let that guide your heart and allow God to use that to help shape you. But, but this is a prompt. It's not a script. It, it's never, it was never delivered to us from Jesus just that we, would, that we would memorize it and just offer it in repetition. It's a prompt to help us develop and help us understand how to pray and how to call upon God. And I love the very first thing he starts with is our Father. Our Father. He reminds us right off the bat of the relationship that we have with God. He reminds us right there of our relationship with God. That God knows us intimately. He knows our wants. He knows our needs. He knows our desires. And he's a good father who desires to hear from his kids. And we have access to the God of this universe. And we don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops to get to him. He's like our dad. That's how Jesus starts. Our father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Yes, God is our Father. And at the same time, we need to remember His majesty. We need to remember His might. We need to remember His power. We need to remember that we are not on the same level. We are not even close to being equals. That God is so much higher than we are. And it's amazing the access that we have to Him. And it's amazing the power and the might and the work that He can do. So remember the name nature of God, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, Your will be done. God, in this situation, God, in this circumstance, God, where I find myself, You be honored. You be glorified. May what You desire happen, which means what I am praying when I pray, God, Your will be done, is I am praying, not my will be done. Prayer recenters us. It refocuses us. It reminds us that God's ways and His will is greater than our ways. It's greater than our desires. God, Your will be done. And when I pray that, what I am saying is not my will. I need to die to myself. I need to exalt God. I need to exalt the things that God has for me and die to my own desires. Give us this day our daily bread. Pray for your needs. Pray for those things that you need that are present in your life. And again, remember when you do this that you're approaching God as a father. And he already knows. I know 90% of what my kids need before they know what they need. That's just my job as their parent. Now, as they get older, that will certainly become less and less. But but I certainly know. I know about 90% of what my kids need before they even ask it, before they even know what they need. I, I know. And when they want something, they just come to me and ask for it. They don't have to tell me, hey, Dad, you're, you're a phenomenal father. You're fantastic. You are great. We are, we are so lucky. We are so lucky to be your kids. They don't, they don't have to approach me that way. They don't, have to approach, they don't have to pull out the thesaurus when there's something that they want and learn new vocabulary words to try to flower me up and try to get it so that I'll agree to, to just ask me for it. Just ask me for it. I love you. I'm I'm your kid. Just ask me what you need. But ask God for what you need. Just get to the point and, and ask Him. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Prayer forces us to look at our spiritual condition. To remind us. Sometimes we mess up. Sometimes we miss it. Sometimes we make mistakes. And ultimately, all sin, ultimately, all sin is against God. We see that in Psalm 51 when David wrote a song after he committed adultery with Bathsheba. In Psalm 51, he says, God, against you, against you I've sinned. Against you I've sinned. He writes that after he commits adultery with Bathsheba and has her husband murdered. He writes, God, It's against you that I have sinned. And and prayer forces us to be introspective and to look at the ways that we have failed, the ways that we've missed the mark. And we're reminded that sometimes that's willful decisions. Sometimes that's things that we've ultimately just said, I, I just don't want to do that, so I'm, I'm not going to do that. And we, and we just don't because of a hardness of heart, because sometimes our flesh still wins like we talked about weeks ago, but whatever the case may be. But sometimes it's much more subtle than that. Sometimes it's accidental things that we've done. Sometimes it's things that we didn't give a second thought to. Or sometimes we're reminded of what James tells us. When James tells us that sin is not just a list of things that we have to abstain from. But James tells us this, that anyone who knows the good that they ought to do and doesn't do it, they sin. And that prayer needs to be a time where we confess those things as well. And so what does that look like, you might ask, to know that the good that you ought to do and not do it? Well, last weekend I was at Walmart one night. And it was late, and it started to rain. And as I'm out in the parking lot, I see an elderly woman unloading her cart into her car. And I hear the Spirit of God whisper on my heart. It's as clear as day as I'm walking past her. 
you should take that cart back for her. There's no question in my mind it was a prompting of God. I thought, okay. And I turned and looked. And as I turned and looked, the rain picked up. And I saw, oh, she's got like three more loads in that cart to unload. And then if I go over, it's at night and it's dark. And I'm a pretty intimidating dude to walk up to somebody. And, you know, there was that whole thing a couple months ago online, which was the dumbest argument I've ever seen in my life, but would you rather encounter a bear or a man? You know, and I'm just like, I just, I don't even want to get into it. And it's raining, and so I'm just going to go to my car. And I took another step, and I, I felt God saying, go get that cart. And I didn't. And I got in my car. And I started to drive home. And the Spirit of God pierced my heart and was like, seriously? You can't serve someone because you're going to get wet? That needed to be confessed. Because I was wrong. That was sin. And there's another element to this. Not only does God offer us mercy and grace and forgiveness, but as recipients of those things, the expectation is that we extend them to people who've wronged us as well. So what bitterness in your heart do you continue to carry for the person that wronged you? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Pray for our struggles. Pray for our temptation. Pray for our spiritual condition. Pray for God to work in every aspect and in every area of our lives. Now, as we've been going through this, I want to give you some tools, not just to learn these ideas in your head, but to make them practical and to, to put them into practice in your life. And so I want to give you a couple different tools right now as, as, we talk, as we've talked about the importance of prayer and now how do we go about doing this. Well, one model that, that I was taught long ago that, that's been helpful in seasons of my life is called the Acts Prayer Model, Acts. The A stands for adoration. So if you don't really know how to, how to pray or you need prompts, then, then use this as, as a prompt. A, adoration. That you spend some time reflecting on how fantastic and wonderful God is. That the, the C stands for confession. And, and, and you just confess those things. That the T is, is thanksgiving. You recognize all the different things that God has done for you. And, and you thank God for those things. And the S stands for supplication, where you ask God for things. You ask God for things. Some of you are, are writers, and I would encourage you to, to journal your prayers. Write them down. Now, again, in the same way that our prayers don't have to be a marathon, you don't have to write a novel every day. If you want to, you can. But just write down, whether it's bullet points or small sentences, whatever the case may be, just journal your prayers. And I've done this in seasons of my life, and I think what's fascinating is sometimes when we're in the midst of a circumstance or a situation, and we know exactly how God should answer that prayer, and He chooses not to. I think it's fascinating to see what happens. Because oftentimes what happens when we find ourselves in that circumstance is, is we become discouraged. We lose heart. But I think one of the great benefits of journaling your prayers is it's fascinating sometimes to go back in that journal two or three years ago and to see that request that you just knew God should answer in a certain way and, and He didn't, and that you were mad and frustrated about at the time. And after some time has played out to see, oh, I didn't know that at the time. Or I didn't have this part of the perspective. Or now I understand. 
why God was doing and why he was answering or not answering a prayer in, in the way that you think you should answer it. And to have the benefit of that time. I think that's one of the benefits. A couple apps I want to tell you about. One is called PrayerMate. I've started to use PrayerMate. It, it's an app. It's, it, you can find it on whatever app store you utilize. Again, it's called PrayerMate. We'll put these apps out this week on social media, links to them to help you. But PrayerMate gives you an opportunity to, to categorize prayers according to, to different ways. It will offer you some prompts. If you want prompts, it will send you some notifications if you want notifications. But it's available in the app store. It's a great resource to help organize your prayers. It's called Prayer Mate. There's another app available called Echo Prayer. A feature on Echo Prayer is called Echo Plus. There is a cost associated with Echo Plus. But with Echo Plus, if you wanted to pray through things as a small group, uh, maybe it's a small group, maybe it's a family, whatever the course, whatever the case may be. If you wanted to invite a couple people or a group of people into praying through the same things, that's available on the app. You can do that for free via an email thread if you want, but if you want it a little more streamlined, you can do that on the Echo app with a subscription to Echo Plus. Like I said, we'll make these resources available this week on a social media post the important thing is that we as people who love and follow Jesus are connecting with the heart of God. The expectation is that we will be praying and that when we pray, it's not to be noticed. It's not for the benefit of other people, for them to see what we're doing, but it's to legitimately connect with God. And when we do that, we can approach him as a father and we have access to the creator of everything who spoke in all this was. And so as people that love and follow Jesus, let's make sure that we are actively engaged in prayer and connecting with God. God, I pray that we would be people who do connect with you and connect with you regularly and are excited and would just free ourselves up from many of the pressure of thinking we have to talk in a certain way or, or pray for a certain amount of time God, that any of that pressure would just be gone and we would delight in every opportunity we have to connect with you in prayer. God, I pray that it would transform our lives as we call on you to meet our needs. To forgive us when we fall short. To help us in situations and circumstances. God, thanks for this incredible privilege that we have. And I, I pray that we wouldn't take it for granted. Thank you for being available to us and loving us and allowing us to call on you. I pray, God, that that would be a real part of our lives. Not for show. Not for others to see. But for you to work, to shape us, change us and transform us for your glory. Thank you, Jesus, for the chance we have to connect with you. It's in your name that we pray.